All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I guess the class is a little thin today. I heard there was a really bad car accident on Northgate, uh, I-5 near Northgate. Uh, but fortunately, you can all uh, download this after uh, class. OK, so what we've been talking about are uh, differential equations x dot equals a times x. And I'm starting to feel a little bit like uh, we're ready to move on from, from x dot equals ax. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going uh, to tell you kind of the last piece of this puzzle for linear differential equations. Okay, there's one type of A matrix that we haven't analyzed yet, and we're going to finish this last piece of the puzzle today. And then for the rest of the week, we're going to think about what would happen when we add in some kind of uh, forcing, some kind of, kind of an external forcing. So what good is a differential equation if we can't interact with it and actually modify the solution to do something we want. So in the example of the pendulum, we might want to stabilize the inverted pendulum to make a rocket ship you know, be able to go up stably with its thrust at the bottom. Uh, for the spring mass, we might, be able, we might want to uh, control a damped oscillation and minimize the reaction at certain frequencies. And so having this input f is going to give us the flexibility to um, model how disturbances enter the system and also how we would control the system with external forcing. OK, but that's going to be the next uh, two lectures on Wednesday and Friday. And one last thing I should mention, uh, the midterm exam is going to come out on Monday next week, not Wednesday. Uh, so this makes it even better for Halloween drinking because it's due on Wednesday next week, not Friday. Uh, so in the morning, before class, I will post the midterm on the website. You'll be able to download it, and then you'll have a fixed amount of time to work on it. So you'll be able to like print it out and then work on it from a, you know, some start time to some end time between Monday and Wednesday. And then you'll uh, either turn it in in hand or email it to the TAs and to me. Okay? So it comes out on Monday. It's due on Wednesday. OK, good. So this next piece of the puzzle I'm going to tell you about for x dot equals ax is actually extremely fascinating. And this has really, really important implications for lots of physical systems, uh, especially fluid dynamic systems. So what I'm going to tell you about are nearly degenerate uh, systems. A. And what I mean by nearly degenerate is that the uh, eigenvectors of A are nearly parallel. Okay, so this seems kind of innocuous, but as my eigenvectors of A become closer and closer to parallel, really interesting and funny things can happen. That's what I'm going to show you today. OK, so this is also very relevant for the homework. Uh, so homework three has one of these degenerate uh, A matrices. So I'm going to cook up another one that is similar. Maybe I'll do this on the far board. OK, so the A matrix that I'm going to look at is minus 0.009, 1, 0, minus 0.01. OK, so first things first, what are the eigenvalues of the system? OK, minus 0.01 and minus 0.009. So first, what is the first thing you notice about this system? What can you say about, about this uh, linear system of equations? Definitely stable for all time, for all initial conditions. Any initial condition I start with will go to 0 as time goes to infinity. Uh, what else can you say about this system? The eigenvalues are super close, right? They're about, you know, they're really, really close to each other, about 10% off. Okay? But the system is technically stable. OK, so what's the next step when I solve a linear system of equations like this? Right, OK, so we're getting ready for the midterm. Uh, I want you all to be able to solve linear systems like this. The next thing you do is you find the eigenvectors. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to look for eigenvector 1 corresponding to lambda 1. 
And I do that by taking a minus lambda 1 times the identity. And I find which vector c1 makes that equal to the 0 vector. Right? Pretty straightforward. We're looking for eigenvectors um, that are mapped to 0 by this a minus lambda i. OK, so a minus lambda times the identity is just, uh, OK, so a minus this lambda times the identity is minus 0 0.009 plus 0 0.01. So that's 0 0.001. The off diagonal terms don't change at all. And then this number and this number cancel, and I get a 0 here. So this is a minus lambda times the identity. Okay. So what types of eigenvectors x and y would make this equal to, uh, to 0? Sorry? So let's try x is 1. And if x is 1, then what does y have to be? Minus 1,000th, minus 0 0.001. OK, so this is the eigenvector c1 corresponding to lambda 1. We can do the same thing. c2 is uh, the solution of a minus lambda 2 times the identity matrix times c2 equals 0, 0. Again, what is a minus this lambda times the identity? Just 0, 1, 0, minus 0 0.001. OK, so what would be an eigenvector of this system? Well, OK, so y has to be equal to 0, because there's no x I can possibly make that would cancel these, right, these terms. So y has to be 0. And x can be anything, because both of those x's are getting multiplied by 0. So I'm just going to say that it's 1, 0. OK, so I have these two eigenvectors. We noticed that our eigenvalues were super close to each other. What about our eigenvectors? really even closer. I mean, these are almost exactly parallel, right? Like, they both point in the C2 points in the 1, 0 direction, and C1 points in the 1.001 direction. They're basically the exact same direction. They're almost exactly parallel. And when you have almost exactly parallel eigenvectors of an A matrix with similar eigenvalues, so the eigenvalues have to be similar. You can get very strange behavior for uh, the solutions of the system. Okay, so we know that this solution is is uh, stable, right? Has to be. But what I'm going to show you in MATLAB is that if I plot the x coordinate, the first coordinate of of, uh, of this solution versus time and I give it some initial condition, it can actually grow almost as if it's going unstable for some time before it actually decays in a stable damping. Extremely weird. We've never seen anything like this before. For all of the stable systems we've looked at before, for every initial condition just gets sucked towards the origin. But here, initial conditions can actually grow in some transient fashion and then get pulled towards the origin. This is really weird, OK? And this is called transient energy growth. And it's responsible for lots of funny things in physical systems that I'm going to tell you about. OK, are there questions about the setup before I go to MATLAB and kind of plot this solution a little bit? OK, we have an A matrix with pretty close to the same eigenvalues, so almost similar eigenvalues, extremely parallel eigenvectors. And what we're going to see is that we get this funny transient energy growth. Okay. 
So first I'm just going to show you the phenomenon in MATLAB, and then we're going to start to think about why this could possibly be true. Okay, project local. There you go. Okay, um, I'm going to do this two ways. One way I'm going to do is just plot it in p-plane, and the other way I'm going to do it is just to do ODE45 and convince you that the solution looks kind of like how I described it. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to make a script. It's a little easier. And on the uh, midterm, I will ask you to know some basic MATLAB. Okay, like I might ask you to write down on pencil and paper, like how to integrate a linear system using ODE45. Or I might ask you to make a plot and show me your three lines of code or something like that. Because this is something we've done a lot of times in class. Okay, so we're going to test what I'm calling a non-normal system. Okay, so the A matrix is um, negative 0.0091, 0, negative 0.01. That's my system. I'm going to integrate uh, from time equals 0 in increments of 0.1 to 1,000. And I'm going to start with an initial condition of 0, 1. So it's a little fuzzy. It's a little hard to see. I apologize. Um, OK, so how do I do ODE45 to get the solution of this? What are the three arguments that I need to give ODE45? So I give it some right-hand side of the differential equation. So for now, I'll just, OK, and the outputs are time and uh, two column vectors for y equals ODE45. Okay, so I'm going to give it some some right-hand side. Okay, so I'm going to tell it it's a function of t and y, and it's a times y. That's just my linear system is y dot equals a times y. I'm going to integrate it for this time span that I've defined, so t equals 0 in increments of 0.1 to 1,000. And I'm going to start with an initial condition of y naught. So I integrate that, and now I'm going to plot my time versus the first column of y. Right? That's, so I have this two-dimensional system. I have kind of x1 and x2. My first column is the x1 coordinate. And we get this funny non- kind of, I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's totally linear, but there's this transient growth before the system eventually becomes stable and goes to zero. This is really weird. We don't know why this should happen yet, OK? Um, also, the units of this are huge, right? It goes up to about 40 before it decays. But my initial condition was 0, 1. So I get a 40 times uh, amplification of my initial condition before it actually goes stable. This is very weird, OK? Now, I told you that this was because we have parallel eigenvectors of the A matrix, or nearly parallel. So I should be able to see this if I run p-plane. OK, so now I'm in p-plane. I'm just going to enter my linear system, which is minus point. OK, so x dot is minus 0 0.009 times x plus y. And y dot is minus 0 0.01 times y. And I'm going to make my display window a little bit large, negative 5 to 5. OK, so if you download p-plane and see it, you can see that there are these little gray arrows which tell you which direction the vector field goes. And so if I go near the origin and I click some initial condition, you can see what the trajectory does is that all of the arrows are pointing really, really strongly to the right. And so my initial condition goes to the right for a long way before it eventually turns around and comes back to the origin. Very, very strange. Okay, So it's only pointing in very near the origin. Let's try another solution. So this red curve is going way out, maybe to like positive 20 before it turns around and comes back in. 
negative solutions do the same thing. And so you can see that this huge excursion in the x direction is that transient growth that we see. Okay? We don't know why this, this is happening yet. We're going to derive, uh, derive this. But what I'm trying to show you here is um, if I integrate this system, I have a huge transient growth in some of the variables before it becomes stable. Okay. Yeah. This growth in one direction and then it goes to zero. But mm -hmm. on P plane, it went to one side and then it went to the other as well. I didn't understand. Right. So P plane is showing me x1 versus x2. It's not showing me x versus time. This is x1 versus time. So remember when I started with that initial condition in P plane, it went way far in the x1 direction and then came back. That's this. It went way far in the x1 direction and then it comes back. If I plotted the x2 direction here, so I'll say hold on plot t, y, colon, 2 in red. The red direction is actually just doing a stable decay. It's acting totally normal. Okay, And that's what we saw in p-plane. So in p-plane, I went way far in x1 and then came back. But in x2, I'm actually just moving straight towards the origin. I'm decaying towards the origin in the, in the vertical direction. OK. So now we're going to figure out why this is happening. OK. So to see why this is happening, what I'm going to do I cooked this system up because this happens uh, very often in real physical systems where you have nearly identical eigenvalues and nearly parallel eigenvectors. What I'm going to do uh, now is actually show you the case when the eigenvectors are exactly parallel and when the eigenvalues are exactly zero, because this is easier to solve. Okay, so this is the case that we're looking at now. Okay, we have exactly equal eigenvalues lambda. And so we're going to try to find uh, what is, you know, x of t, x at time t is going to be e to the a matrix times time times x naught, right? This is always true for linear systems, always. Except for this type of A matrix, where you have repeated eigenvalues and a one kind of off diagonal, I can't diagonalize it. This is as close to diagonal as I can possibly make this matrix. Okay? There's like a whole bunch of linear algebra that explains why I can't diagonal diagonalize this. And if you want to know more about it, you can look up uh, the Jordan canonical form. It's quite fascinating. Um, how many of you have heard of the Jordan canonical form before? Okay, this is pretty good stuff. So um, there's a lot of good books. You can find it in like this book by Perko. But this is really kind of beyond what I want to do in this class. Um, this is what you would get in a dynamical systems class is finding what all of these canonical forms are when you can't perfectly diagonalize a system. Um, this is the only case that you couldn't diagonalize, is when you have repeated eigenvalues with parallel eigenvectors. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is, um, what I want to do is I want to split this A matrix into two parts. The diagonal part and the off-diagonal part. And I'm going to call this S and this T. Okay. Now remember, if I have E to the number S plus number T, that's equal to E to the S times E to the T. Right? But this is not true with matrices in general. 
in general, e to the big S plus big T is not equal to e to the big S, e to the big T. It's funny. You can try it. Like, it's just, it's not true. Okay? You can try it in MATLAB, like, do the matrix exponential. But e to the big matrix S plus T is equal to e to the S, e to the T, if S times T equals T times S. Okay, this has a name in mathematics. It's so important. This is called commuting. So if the matrix S times T is equal to the matrix T times S, then S and T are commutative. They commute with each other. You can swap their order, and the equations don't change. Okay? This is not true for all matrices. If you just pick two matrices out of a hat, they will not be commutative. I guarantee it. Okay, if you randomly pick two matrices, they will not commute. Only very special matrices will commute with each other. Okay? This is really, really important in quantum mechanics, commutative matrices. So this is a theorem you could prove if you wanted to. You could prove this. I don't want to prove this. Um, if you did want to prove it, you would use the binomial theorem, and you would say matrix S plus T to the kth power, let's say to the nth power, is equal to n factorial sum of j plus k equals n of the matrix s to the j, t to the k, over j factorial, k factorial. If you wanted to prove this theorem, you would take this binomial expansion and you'd plug it into the Taylor series of e to the s plus t. And it would separate into two Taylor series of e to the s times e to the t. I don't want to do it. This is not uh, like a pure math class. We're not going to prove things. But you could prove this theorem with this binomial expansion if you wanted to. Okay. But the point is that I can take my A matrix and I can split it into the diagonal matrix and this off-diagonal matrix S and T. And it turns out that these matrices do commute with each other. S times T does equal T times S for this very special set of matrices. And we can just verify it, right? S times T is 0, 0, lambda, 0. 0, 0, lambda, 0. And that's exactly what I get if I switch the order and multiply. I get 0, 0, lambda, 0. So that equals T times S. OK? These matrices do commute. And so the nice thing is, is that e to the matrix A T is equal to e to the matrix S times time times e to the matrix T times time. This is true because S and T have this special property that they commute. So it would not be true otherwise. OK, who's with me so far? I didn't prove. I didn't prove that this is true, but we're just using this fact that we can split A into S and T. They commute. And so I can write E to the S plus T as E to the S times E to the T. OK? Now, we know how to solve E to the diagonal matrix, right? So what is that first one? What's E to the S plus T or S times T? Yeah, E to the lambda T is on the diagonal. And 0 is elsewhere, right? But how do I solve this e to the matrix t times time? This is the last piece of the, the puzzle here. What do I do for e to the this matrix t? What do we do if we don't know how to solve a system e to the matrix times time. Well, so we could try to diagonalize it, but this is exactly the form lambda lambda 1. So I'm telling you that we can't diagonalize this one. We'll get stuck in an infinite loop trying. We can always go back to the first principles. In the first few lectures, how did we derive the solution e to the at? Taylor series. So let's think about the Taylor series for e to the t. 
So e to the matrix t time is going to equal what? What's the Taylor series for this? Identity matrix plus, plus t times time plus 1 half big matrix t squared times time squared plus dot, 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 dot. OK? But t squared is equal to 0. And t cubed is equal to 0. And t to the fourth is equal to 0. And all powers of t above t to the 1 are equal to 0. That's always true of these kind of off diagonal. If I have zeros on the diagonal and I have 1s above it, then I can take powers of t and eventually it will become 0. So all of this is equal to 0. And e to this matrix t times time is just the identity matrix plus t times time. Really simple matrix. That's e to the t times time. Identity matrix plus t times time. OK? Any questions at this point? There's a lot of steps. This is a big recipe. Okay, So we're cooking something nice here. But it takes a lot of steps, and we have to remember what step we're in. Okay, We have this A matrix with repeated eigenvalues. We can split it into S and T. And I'm telling you that because of some special fact of those matrices, the solution E to the A times time is e to the s time times e to the t time. And now we know what e to the t is. It's 1, t, 0, 1. And so the full solution to this equation is e to the lambda t. Now t e to the lambda t. That's interesting. 0 and e to the lambda t. OK, this is pretty cool. So we're going to box this. This is the solution. And notice that we get this new term that we've never seen before. We have this t e to the lambda t. We've never seen this term before in linear systems of equations, at least not in this class. So this is an entirely new term. And they are sometimes called secular terms. Don't ask me why. Curious why, actually. I want to know, but I don't. Um, and if I plot t e to the lambda t, it looks like that transient growth that we saw. Okay, So t and e to the lambda t are competing with each other. e to the lambda t is trying to damp everything out. But t is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And for a little while, it's actually getting bigger faster than e to the lambda t is getting smaller. And so for the first part of this transient growth, the t term is winning. Until then, the e to the, e to the lambda t term starts to dominate. So the transient growth that we saw is entirely due to these kind of secular terms, these t e to the lambda t terms. Now, for this kind of system, you exactly have these terms. In the system I showed you in the first example, where the eigenvectors were only, you know, the eigenvalues were only close to each other and the eigenvectors were nearly parallel, it's getting closer and closer to this canonical form. OK, questions? Did you see similar behavior where the uh, system is unstable? So when the system is unstable, e to the lambda t is trying to blow up, and t is trying to blow up. So they just both blow up, but it will blow up faster, slightly faster than just e to the plus t. So this is only really seen for stable eigenvalues. Yeah, that's a really good point. So you'll only notice this for stable lambda, for a lambda with negative real part. OK, and we can plot this in MATLAB. Um, let's just do it really quickly. It's 
weird. Okay. So what I'm just going to do is make a t vector 0 in increments of 0.01 to 20. And I'm going to plot t by t times e to the minus t. Okay. So notice that I'm doing t dot times. Why do I have a dot times in here? Right, because these are both vectors. t is a vector, and e to the minus t is also a vector. And so dot times is going to multiply them element-wise, and I'll get each element in a new vector. Okay. And so when I plot this, I get my nice, beautiful, transient growth in that coordinate that we saw before. And this is purely because of that extra secular term t e to the minus lambda t. Okay. So I'm just convincing you that that's exactly what this term looks like, is transient growth before an eventual decay. Okay. Good. OK, now a couple other things I want to show you. Yeah. Which column is formed by MATLAB? So I literally just drew this one term. But the x, so x1 is going to equal some linear combination of these things. And so the x1 coordinate is going to have this secular term, but the x2 is not. Which is why when we plotted in this case, the x1 term had that big transient growth, but the x2 term was just decaying to the origin. Okay. The homework problem, I flipped it. So the x2 direction will have the transient growth, and the x1 will be attracting to the origin. It's a little more physical if you think of v as a velocity. The second component is a velocity. It's a little more physical. OK, so this is actually good. We're getting very close to being done with e to the at, because <laughs> um, this is the last piece of the puzzle. So it turns out that you can have other, even worse, secular terms if I have uh, I could have an A matrix that is like lambda, 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 1, 1, 0. I think uh, I need to watch Revenge of the Nerds again. OK, and you can get an E to the AT. So notice here now I have a triplicate lambda, and I have two ones on the off diagonal, so this is even worse. Then this e to the at is going to be e to the lambda t's on the diagonal, just like before. 0, 0, 0. And just like before, I'm going to have my first order secular term, t e to the lambda t, t e to the lambda t. But up here in the upper right, I'm actually going to get a 1 half t squared e to the lambda t. So I can get second order secular terms. If I had a quadruple eigenvalue, I could get t to the third e to the lambda t's. If I had quintuple eigenvalues, I could have t to the fourth e to the lambda t's. I can get arbitrarily many of these e to the lambda t's. And something interesting that happens when you have these, so if I have a, like, let's say I have a t to the fifth e to the lambda t, where e to the lambda t is stable. OK, I'm going to draw this one in black. And I'm going to draw t e to the lambda t in red. So remember, our original transient energy growth was just like that. But if I have like a fifth order secular term, because maybe I had six repeated eigenvalues, then it's actually going to look more like that. So the peak is going to move to the right in time. So the peak is going to be delayed in time, which is a weird phenomenon. But we see this in lots of systems. So if you see something that grows really slowly to a huge value and then comes back down, and it comes back down quickly, then this is probably a high order secular term. OK, this is just something you should know. Uh, OK, good.
Okay, so we had, we've seen two different types of A matrices with repeated eigenvalues, and they have very different behavior. So I want to look at these two different A matrices. I call it a tail of two A matrices. In the first case, we've seen A equals 1, 0, 1, 0. Or sorry, 1, 0, 0, 1, the diagonal matrix, the identity. This A has repeated eigenvalues. Lambda 1 equals 1, lambda 2 equals 1. We know what the solution of the system is, right? Yeah, it's just e to the t, 0, 0, e to the t, right? Simple. It's diagonal. We know how to solve this system. Okay, and what we could do is we could try to compute the eigenvectors of this A matrix. So how would we do that? We would say, well, A minus lambda times the identity times C equals the zero vector, right? But A minus lambda times the identity is just identity minus identity. It's 0, 0, 0, 0 times you know, x and y equals 0, 0. So what are some possible eigenvectors? What are some possible x and y that make this true? All x and y, right? All x and y make this true. So I can have c1. equals just the x vector, and c2 equals the y vector. I can just pick them to be orthogonal. Because a minus lambda i is completely rank deficient. It has rank 0, meaning all vectors in the plane will map to 0. OK, and what this means is that I have two unique eigenvectors for that eigenvalue lambda. I have two completely unique eigenvectors because I have two whole directions that map to 0 by this matrix. So remember before we were looking for the determinant of a minus lambda i to equal 0 to find eigenvalues? Now we have to look at the rank. So the rank of a minus lambda i here is 0. It has 0 rank. Okay, so I have two degrees of freedom that will map to the zero vector. I have the x direction and the y direction. And that's why this A matrix is easy in some sense, because I have two orthogonal eigenvectors. Okay, let's look at the second case that we did today. A equals 1, 1, 0, 1. Again, identical eigenvalues. Lambda 1 equals 1. Lambda 2 equals 1. We now know what the solution is. It's e to the a t equals e to the t, t e to the t, 0 e to the t. OK? But it's a little bit more complicated. When I can try to compute the eigenvector of this, I say a minus lambda identity times c equals 0. What's a minus lambda times the identity? Well, it's just a minus the identity, because lambda is 1. So I get 0, 1, 0, 0. So what do we notice right off the bat with this eigenvector equation? Well, I mean, first thing I noticed that I could write an eigenvector uh, 1, 0, right? Y has to be 0 because I have nothing to cancel this term. X can be anything. But the other thing I notice is that this matrix has rank 1. And so there's only one eigenvector direction that maps to 0. Before, I had this kind of zero rank a minus lambda i matrix. So both the x and the y directions map to zero. But here, a minus lambda i only has rank one. It's only, so a has rank two. Okay? 
And so this only is one lower than this, which means that it only maps one direction to zero. And I only have one eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. It's really weird. Okay? To find more what are called generalized eigenvectors, we have to solve a minus lambda i squared times c2 equals 0, 0. OK, so how many of you remember generalized eigenvectors from linear algebra? You know, it doesn't get talked about that often. I almost brushed it under the rug. I wanted to. But it's really important to tell you a little bit more about what's going on here. When you have repeated eigenvalues, when you have repeated eigenvalues and a minus lambda i is that many eigenvalues lower rank than a, then I get two or however many unique eigenvector directions. Okay, if I had three eigenvalues, then I would want this rank, I would still want this to be 0, and then I would have three unique eigenvector directions, and my system would be simple, diagonal. Okay? In this case, I have a rank 2 system, and I have a multiplicity 2 eigenvalue. I have an eigenvalue that's repeated twice. But a minus lambda i only has rank 1. So there's only one eigenvector for that eigenvalue unless I start solving for these generalized eigenvectors. Okay, so in this case, essentially this is geometrically what's different between these two cases. In one of the cases, a minus lambda i has a lower rank than in the other case, so I need to introduce new eigenvectors here. That's as much as I want to talk about generalized eigenvectors and Jordan canonical forms. If you were taking a whole class on linear algebra and differential equations, then we would go more into depth about how to compute all of these eigenvectors and what they mean physically. Um, but for now, if you have a system like this, you have to get the extra t e to the lambda t terms. Okay, and they give you transient energy growth. Okay, any questions before I move on? I got a few more minutes. So I could talk more about math, or I could talk a little bit about physics. Uh, so I want to talk to you about physics right now. Okay, so these types of A matrices, A equals 1, 1, 0, 1, are called non normal. Non-normal means it does not satisfy A transpose times A equals A, A transpose. Okay, if this equation was true, then A would be called a normal matrix. And it would definitely have unique eigenvectors for every single multiple eigenvalue. And this comes up a lot in fluid flows. Okay? So if I have a shear flow where I have lower velocity on the bottom and then it gets faster and faster and faster, so, um, so partial u velocity with respect to y is some constant, this comes up all the time. If I have a boundary layer flow, so I have flow going past a wing, then often what I'll have is some kind of a laminar flow, and then eventually it'll become turbulent. But in this laminar region, the velocity profile looks like a shear flow. Looks like that. Okay? And if I take this A matrix and I multiply a little unit cube, you'll see what I mean by shear. I mean, these guys were really creative when they named these. It literally looks like a pair of shears. Let's see if I can draw this. OK, so if I take this unit cube and I map it through A, this box shears. It looks like a pair of shears. OK, it's a shear flow. 
And what we find is that in the laminar fluid regime, the system is stable. Okay, meaning that if I kicked the flow a little bit, if I added a little burst of air or a little tornado, that little tornado or burst of air, it's going to convect downstream, but it's going to damp out and die. Okay, the flow is trying to maintain this laminar solution. It's going to kill all disturbances. Except in these shear flows, what happens is if I have some disturbance in time or in the x coordinate, they're basically the same thing because everything's moving from left to right, that disturbance might initially grow before it then decays, right? Because I have this non normal A matrix. Initially, even though all disturbances are eventually going to die out in this laminar region, First, they might grow in magnitude, like 40 or 50 or even 1,000 times their original magnitude before they die out. So this little tornado might actually get super strong before it then dies out. Okay? And what's interesting is that because we're talking about a fluid flow, it's not just a linear system. There's also a nonlinearity. So it's you know, x dot equals some... Um, matrix plus some nonlinear function of x. And so there's some turbulent threshold. So that even if I'm in the linear stable regime where transient disturbances should die out, they should be stable, if my disturbance grows large enough then it'll actually start to excite nonlinearities, and the solution will go chaotic and turbulent. This is a really weird phenomenon. People had observed this in fluid flows for decades, systems where they knew that it was linearly stable, but disturbances would keep growing and growing and growing and then trip the system into a turbulent flow. So a pipe is a great example of this. A pipe is linearly stable for all flow velocities. If you have flow going through a pipe, it should be stable for all flow velocities if you look at the partial differential equation. Any amount of roughness in the wall creates disturbances, and those disturbances grow until they excite nonlinearities and trip the, tur the pipe into turbulent flow. So if you polished your pipe well enough, I have a friend, I swear to God, he polished a pipe for two weeks, and he got the most laminar flow in a pipe that's ever been recorded because all turbulence in pipes come from wall roughness and disturbances. He was a great polisher of pipes, and he has one of the best papers in High Reynolds number fluid flows like in existence today, because he was able to keep these disturbances small so that they didn't transiently grow and excite nonlinearities. Okay, not all of you are fluid mechanicians, but everybody loves pretty pictures. So I'm just going to show you a couple of videos of this until the bell rings. OK, let's see if I can find a turbulent boundary layer. So this is a direct numerical simulation of a turbulent boundary layer. This is what's happening over your airplane wing. And these disturbances are moving down the plate. Ooh, something bad's happening. They're moving down the plate. And you can see these turbulent structures coming in and out of the plane. They're getting amplified. So these are the kinds of nonlinear turbulent flow features that are being amplified. And you can trip an otherwise stable flow into this nasty, turbulent regime if you give it a large enough disturbance. And if that disturbance is aligned in the flow direction so that it has non-normal energy growth. OK, that's all for today. Next time, we're going to add forcing to differential equations.